Welcome to the Abide In Me podcast, where we're countering the malaise of modern culture and superficial spirituality by taking aim at the truth. We'll be looking for answers to the big life questions. What was our origin? Where can we find meaning and purpose? How do we discern between good and evil? Fact and fiction? And what is our ultimate destination? All links and resources are provided in the podcast notes. Enjoy this week's episode. Hi, everyone. I wanted to talk today about suffering. And it's not a a particularly pleasant topic, but I think that it's apt for the times that we're in. And one of the things that we need to recognize is that our beliefs, what we believe about the world and ourself is going to have a massive influence on the level of suffering that we have. And it's also one of those topics that is brought up by people who don't believe in God as a proof against God. It's the uh, problem of evil, really, but it could also be the problem of suffering. Why is there suffering in the world? Why do people suffer and go through pain? Why is there evil? If a good and loving God exists, and it's one of those questions that people have grappled with over millennia, And it is the most popular argument for atheists to use when they are debating people who believe in God. And so let's talk about it, because I see a lot of people actually struggling with that question now. I'd be hard pushed to think of anyone who I know who hasn't been through some kind of um, dramatic event over the past four years or a series of dramatic events and changes, whether it be illnesses or deaths in the family or divorces or mental illness, financial problems. It just seems that everyone is being shaken up on some level. And there's a lot of depression out there. There are a lot of people asking why. There are a lot of people asking how to change these problems really because these problems seem so utterly overwhelming because it's not just things that are going on in our personal life that perhaps we have some control over it's all these things that are happening in the world and so it's easy to become despondent it's easy to be nihilistic it's easy to despair and to have no hope especially if we either don't really believe in anything Or we have either a a humanistic worldview or a worldview that says that we are just in a material universe and all of this, our existence, the universe and everything is just a giant accident. And so even that might be a popular intellectual belief held by many famous atheists like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett, Lawrence Krauss. It actually doesn't bring much hope because it means that we are then relying solely on ourselves, the human race, to sort out all of these problems. And if you've been alive for more than two decades, in other words, if you're an adult, you must surely understand that human beings over the course of history have in fact not been able to sort out these problems And it is because there is something deeply flawed within us. And that is not a belief that people want to accept. Because what we want to believe that people are basically good. And if we just have enough time, we will be able to create enough technology or come up with new solutions for problems in the world just by using our human minds and that maybe in a hundred years time we would have sorted out poverty, we would have cured all of these diseases or that AI would have solved everything for us. That there's some kind of 
superhuman, beyond human intelligence that we, of course, have created. Artificial intelligence that is going to somehow solve all of these problems. But of course, all you've done there is replace the idea of God, something that is beyond us, with a computer program. And then people will start, and already have started, to worship the concept of AI as being a saviour. And so we're left with, with three options, really. You can either believe that humans are going to sort everything out, and past history will prove you wrong. You can either believe that computers are going to save the day, but of course we've created computers and technology, so that isn't probably going to work, but mainly because they're not human, that computers aren't moral beings. It is, it is pure intelligence, if you like, the crunching of computer code, which hopefully makes everyone feel slightly uneasy. And the third option, of course, is that we do indeed have a creator. We don't just live in a purely mechanistic, materialistic, accidental universe, and that we can call on that creator to help us, not just with the problems in the world, but of course, to transform us, because that is what is needed. It's not that we need more time for humans to work all of this stuff out. It's that humans need to be transformed. And pretty much every spiritual tradition understands that. They might say it in different ways, but every spiritual tradition, which means that we're not just thinking of ourselves as animals is going to look at the world and say, yeah, we need to be changed so that we can make better decisions, so that we're not corrupt, that we don't do evil and wicked things, and that we ourselves don't continue to cause the vast majority of the suffering in the world, either through apathy or stupid decisions or selfish decisions or through hatred or envy or jealousy. We, our hearts, our minds need to be transformed. And is that transformation just going to take more time? That's what the humanistic view would suggest. Or is it going to be chips in our brains? Do we need to merge with technology and AI so that we can become better people? Or are we going to open up to our creator through prayer and ask to be transformed through his spirit, which of course is the Christian view? I think a lot of people today would prefer the technological option. In other words, if they could get a sort of upgrade, a computer upgrade or some sort of download into their brain to make them better people, they would probably choose that. Because a lot of us, a lot of people have been convinced in a way that we are just avatars in a computer program. Certainly younger people, I think, have this perception, whether it's conscious or not, that this is what's going on. They are so linked into technology now that they almost see themselves as avatars who can change, well, even really basic stuff like their gender um, at the drop of a hat and they will just simply become different people because, of course, they don't have the psychological understanding yet of how dangerous that can be. We are not, in fact, computer simulations. We are human beings. And so even though the technological route seems easier because we've been kind of conditioned to start to see ourselves as human robots in a way, it is a very cold reality. And maybe some people would prefer that because they don't want to feel anymore. They don't really want to think anymore. Everything has got so confusing now that it would be so much easier to just have a chip in my brain and have a computer tell me what to think and feel and do. But of course, that is the road to death because we are human beings. And part of being a human being is learning how to deal with suffering, pain, evil, problems, things that we don't know how to solve. All of that grappling is about being human and it helps us to grow. So given that suffering is just very much a part of life, we're never going to get away from that. What belief system is going to provide us with a strong foundation 
so that we can weather the storm? And firstly, it has to be a belief system that actually makes sense, that actually stands up to scrutiny, that is actually coherent. Because if it isn't, if it's just a bunch of beliefs that you like the sound of, but that actually contradict each other, you, of course, are going to feel unstable because you're going to bounce from one to the other. And that is why we see so much instability today, because people's beliefs are not coherent. And so people have beliefs that they want to be true, but if they followed them to their logical conclusion, they would realise that they don't actually believe them or act as if they believe them in the world. The coherent outcome, the logical outcome of holding to a materialistic view of the universe and everything, in other words, everything popped into existence without a cause in an instant and over billions of years somehow created itself into this universe and then into life and into plants and trees and animals and human beings. But essentially it's just a giant accident and we are all determined by our biology and we don't have any free will and we're just kind of going around pretending that we have free will. The logical conclusion to that belief system is nihilism. Okay, it is recognising the futility of existence and there should be an underlying depression. There should be a feeling of why should I even get up in the morning? Because if this is all just a giant accident and we are just kind of meat robots wandering around, what is the ultimate purpose of anything? It's just things that we make up in our mind. So therefore we have to make up a bunch of beliefs. We have to kid ourselves on, as people say in Scotland, that we have meaning and purpose. These are just nice things that we tell ourselves rather than being a reality that is grounded in truth. But because so many people have been convinced that we don't need to ground things in truth and that things don't need to be coherent, they will continue to choose beliefs that they think are going to make them feel good or intelligent or whatever it is they're looking for. And they will continue to be confused and angry and upset and accusing everyone else of doing things and trying to find solutions to problems, but failing in that. They are going to be unstable because they haven't grounded their belief system in anything apart from their own fantasy of what they would like the world to be like. Sometimes I have to use silly or extreme examples to hammer this point home. If you asked me what I thought about the moon and I said to you, well, I think the moon is made out of cheese. And you said, well, we know that the moon isn't made out of cheese, you know. We've been to the moon. People have brought back moon rocks. You know, we have evidence to suggest that the moon isn't made out of cheese. And I say to you, I don't really care about any of that because my parents told me the moon is made out of cheese. I look up at the moon at night and I see all the craters in it. And that means it's made out of cheese. And so... That's my belief. I've been told it over and over again. I like the belief and I don't really care if it's grounded in reality. That's my belief. The moon is made out of cheese. So you can see with a kind of silly example that that's how a lot of people act. They don't feel the need to ground anything in evidence and truth. It's just about what they have been told, what they want to believe to make them feel better. And this lack of coherence and logic and evidence leads them to become very emotional when you start to probe their beliefs. And that's what we're seeing today, just people being very, very emotional when you were pointing out just obvious logical facts that counter their emotional belief system. And it's causing people a lot of suffering. A lot, most of the suffering that is going on in the world is caused by us. 
So instead of going down the well-worn path of discussing the problem of evil, which of course you could just go online and uh, search on YouTube for debates on this topic, um, I want to get a bit more specific about it because often it's discussed in really abstract terms. If there's a good God, why is there evil? People will talk about the horrors of children getting cancer or torture and just list all the evil things that are going on in, in the world as if that were a proof that God doesn't exist. But it's all very intellectual, it's all very abstract and so I want to talk about some personal experiences and I would also encourage people to um, listen to people's testimonies, people who were not believers, who were suffering and then became believers. I think that that is a, an important aspect of this because the problem of evil tends to suggest that when people see evil in the world, they lose their faith because they are thinking, well, God can't possibly be real if I'm personally suffering. What they don't do is talk about the people who come to faith through suffering. And that's what I want to talk a bit about today. So there was a debate between Richard Dawkins and Ian Hersey Ali. Ian uh, spent many years talking out against the horrors and dangers of radical Islam. She herself was brought up in that tradition and escaped basically, and has been speaking out against it ever since. But she was also part of the kind of atheist group. She came out of Islam and then became an atheist. And so she became friends with people like Richard Dawkins. And so it's an interesting debate because she has recently come to faith. And she came to faith through her suffering. And so this debate, which I couldn't watch all of because I find it quite difficult now to listen to Richard Dawkins, because he he really, well, he contradicts himself all the time, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in this particular debate, he was doing his usual thing of saying to her, his friend, oh, well, yes, but all this, all these things that you believe now, I mean, it's just nonsense, isn't it? I mean, it's just nonsense. I mean, how can you believe it? And he just kept saying it over and over again. And that is not an argument. Saying something is nonsense, that might be your opinion, but it's not a coherent argument. And so she relayed her testimony and she basically said that she was looking at society, first of all, as a lot of people are, especially in the West, the kind of crumbling of morality and realising that the bedrock that had been there for so long, which was essentially Christianity, biblical values had been eroded and that we somehow needed to get back to that because of this idea that people hold today that there isn't any truth, that everything is now entirely subjective. And so she started to think about Christianity in terms of the culture, first of all, which is what a lot of people are talking about now, cultural Christianity. So the ideas of Christ and his teachings and the teachings of the Bible, the Ten Commandments, etc., out with an actual belief in God or Jesus. So that's kind of the first rung of the ladder that a lot of people today take. But what brought her to faith in Christ was the fact that she had been a long-term sufferer of depression, that she had had many years of therapy to no avail until she found a therapist who said to her, I think you are in spiritual crisis there is something missing. I think it's not just a psychological issue here. And that rang true with her and she started to read the Bible. She started to go to church and she says that she has now been healed of this all pervasive depression. So she's pouring out this very personal testimony and story. And this is her friend, Richard Dawkins, claiming that this is all nonsense, the things that she now, now believes in is all nonsense, because he cannot accept that there is a loving and caring God that can, in fact, actually transform us. That is something that is so beyond his current worldview that he, he, he can't even articulate an argument against it. 
The interesting thing is, and why I say that he contradicts himself, is that he accepts that the the morals, the ethical system, the values within Christianity are a good bedrock for society. So in some ways he is culturally Christian and he loves going into beautiful churches and he recognises the beauty of the Psalms and all of this kind of stuff. But what he's doing there, as a lot of people who are culturally Christian are doing, is taking all the bits that they like out of Christianity but stripping them from their source. Atheists do this all the time. They take the idea of human value, in other words, that we are created in the image of God, and try and implant it into their atheistic, materialistic worldview. But you can't ground it into that, because in the materialistic worldview, this is all just a giant accident. There is no purpose, there is no meaning, there is no plan, there is no creator with a will and a desire to create something with a purpose for everything that we see in everyone's life. It's just a giant accident. And so maybe Richard Dawkins is is beginning to wrestle with God (laughs) and wrestle with some of these issues. It's often when your friends start to come to faith that you start to think about it because, of course, He respects Ayan Hirsi Ali. She's a very intelligent, articulate, thoughtful person. So he can't really just do his usual trick of saying, oh, this is just silliness and it's just fairy tales and it's just people that want to believe in stories. And he can't do that with her because he knows her and respects her. So maybe this will get him to start to think deeper about these issues. But she is someone who came to faith through her suffering because she was willing to do what a lot of people are still not willing to do in their suffering, which is to cry out to God. It's such a barrier. I speak to people all the time who are suffering, who have got their backs against the wall, whether it's a health issue that they can't solve or a financial problem they can't solve or a relationship problem they can't solve or they're looking at all the turmoil in the world and tearing their hair out and they refuse, refuse to ask God for help in prayer and they will say it's because I don't believe and when I ask why they don't believe, they don't have an answer because they haven't actually thought about it. It's just a dismissal, a wave of the hand, a Richard Dawkins, oh, because it's just nonsense idea, but they have not thought about it. But part of it is not just that they haven't thought about it. There's, I can see there is just this barrier of pride It's pride. It's saying, you have to say at some point, I can't solve this problem. I give up. I surrender. It's beyond me. Whereas we have been brought up in a society that says, if you surrender, you are weak. You're worth nothing. You're not a capable person. You should be able to sort all of your problems out and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You should be able to go it alone. So I understand why it's difficult because it's totally counterculture. But if you are not prepared to surrender, to just say, God, I can't do this anymore, please help me, then you are going to continue to do it alone. And so I've said this many times before, there really is no downside to praying. No downside whatsoever. There is no downside, certainly, in actually taking some time to think about your own belief system, where it has come from, is it grounded in reality, and actually thinking about the very basics of our existence and saying, okay, first of all, why is there anything at all? Why is there a universe in the first place? We know now that the universe had a beginning. That's what the Big Bang Theory tells us. Years ago, scientists just thought that the universe was eternal, okay, which was kind of convenient because they didn't have to think about why it began to exist. But now we know that the universe began to exist. And so what caused it to begin to exist? Because 
in every other area of life, if something begins to exist, it has a cause. And it's not just begins to exist, it's, it's being invented. All the elements of the periodic table did not exist, and then they existed. So what caused that to exist? What caused the laws of nature to exist? What caused mathematics to exist? And what the atheistic, materialistic worldview says is nothing. Nothing. That does not make sense. It does not make sense. You may want to choose to believe it because then you don't have to think about a creator. But it does not make sense to say that the universe sprang into existence in an instant, without a cause, out of nothing. And these atheistic scientists try to tie themselves up into knots to explain how this could possibly happen. Daniel Dennett says something like, the universe created itself, which is totally incoherent. The universe would have to, at first, exist before it created itself. It's incoherent. What is much more likely, because of course we're talking about what is more likely, we don't have a time machine that can go back into time and see what happened. But it is much more likely that a vastly powerful intelligence with a will and a desire to create something created the universe, or rather invented the universe with all of its embedded intelligibility mathematics, complexity, laws, fine-tuning, it is much more likely that a vast intelligence that is outside of all of that, that isn't material, that isn't energy, that isn't time, that isn't space, that isn't made up of anything out of the periodic table, why? because it invented all of those things, so it can't be made of all of those things. So we have a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful intelligence that decided, had a desire, had the will, had the power, had the intelligence to create everything that we see, to bring into existence, to invent everything in the universe. That is what we call God. It is not a god of the gaps. It is inferring from the evidence that we have what is the most logical explanation for the fact that there is anything at all. So that is the grounding of my faith in God because we have to go back to the very beginning. If your belief in God is just kind of like a feeling, I feel that God exists or I'd like to believe that God exists then it's not going to be grounded in anything. It needs to be grounded in evidence, in logic, in coherence, in truth. And from that starting point, you can then move forward. You can then get to the point of saying, OK, so I believe that there's a creator. I believe there's a God. I don't understand how or why or what. I don't understand anything about it, but that makes sense. Then you can move forward to say, OK, let's look at the Bible Let's find out if the Bible is reliable as a witness to God and human interaction. Then let's move forward to say, okay, here's Jesus, the most famous person in the entire world, the person who we split our calendar with, BC, AD. Let's find out, let's learn, let's look to see if what is said about him in the Bible is worth thinking about, worth studying. Because if we've already worked out that the Bible is reliable, then we have to take what the apostles said about him seriously, not least because they all died for what they believed in. And so then we learn about the life of Jesus and what he said about himself, what he says about the world, what he says about God the Father. And then we have a strong foundation to rest our faith on.
And then we're going to have this experience. If we can lower our pride and pray and ask for transformation, ask for healing as Ayan Hirsi Ali did, and we are going to experience God's love, God's transformational power, God's peace, God's guidance, God's provision, all of the things that people are crying out for, but they're crying out to the wrong people. You're crying out to the government. You're crying out to your friends and family who are having the same kind of problems as you. You're looking towards celebrity idols to tell you what to do, or personal development people, or new age gurus, or Hindu gurus, or the Dalai Lama. Who are you crying out to? Why don't you cry cry out to the creator of the universe? Oh, well, I don't believe in God. Why not? If you haven't even looked into it, if you haven't even thought about it. And so this is my encouragement for people who are struggling. Recognise that you may be struggling because your beliefs just don't make sense and they're not coherent. You might like them, but they might not be coherent. And so there are four things to watch out for when you're starting to examine your own belief system or test other belief systems that are out there. The first one is the Dunning-Kruger effect. People relate this to uh, people who believe in a flat earth. But essentially, it's a kind of confirmation bias that's born out of willful ignorance. So people think that they are experts in a certain area and it makes them feel very superior, but in fact, they don't know anything about it at all. And so this kicks in with Christianity because, of course, people think they know what Christ taught. They think they know who Christ is. Yeah, 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 we know about the Bible and we know the Bible stories, um, but we've rejected them because, as Richard Dawkins says, it's all just nonsense, isn't it? That is done in Kruger, and we all can get into that. And it comes from a place of pride, which is one of the other things to look out for. And alongside this is also this lack of coherence I've been talking about, this lack of critical thinking. And the fourth thing is this error of subjectivity that everyone has bought into, that if I believe something, it's true. And if I don't believe it, it's not true. And I can make up whatever I want to believe. And all of those things are true, even if they contradict each other. Your truth and my truth can change on an hourly basis. And it just doesn't matter because it's all just a matter of perspective. So subjectivity, willful ignorance, lack of coherence and the pride that comes from the Dunning-Kruger effect are something that we all need to watch out for because they are all going to be barriers to us finding out the real truth. And so I know from my own experience that Christianity is not easy to believe in. I remember reading The God Delusion back in, whenever it came out, 2007, was it? Something like that. Reading it and delighting in it. Delighting in that kind of scoffing, derisive attitude. Oh, this is just nonsense and these people don't know what they're talking about. And, you know, all the sound bites that atheists use today. I was quite happy to take all of that on board Because at the time I was suffering, and at the time I couldn't even conceive that there would be a God. I was much more comfortable with relying on my own intelligence, my own mind, my own will to solve my own problems. And I tried to do that for a very long time, and I had some success at it. This is why therapy and uh, going to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist Someone who is going to hold a mirror up to you is useful because we're not very good at seeing ourselves and how to solve our own problems. But it only takes us so far. We need a foundation on which to stand. And that foundation is, well, this is just a giant accident and everything is ultimately futile. Or we're not an accident. We were created for a reason, as was the rest of the universe. And what the biblical narrative tells us is that we have a loving God who created us to be in relationship with him. He created us with free will, which means we can choose to do good or evil. 
and we generally choose to do evil. And so we are separated in part from our creator, but he would like us to come back to him. He would like us to be reconciled. And the biblical story is about how he wants us to be reconciled. What he requires from us to be in relationship with him. And he really doesn't require much. He requires acknowledgement and faith that he can heal us, he can transform us, he can guide us, love us, forgive us, and to give us not just something to believe in, he's given us someone to believe in, someone who shared in our sufferings, and that is Jesus Christ. It's very difficult to ground a belief in a concept of God. But if we have a person, that's who we have faith in. We have faith in Jesus. And millions and billions of people throughout time have put their faith in this person who is constantly reaching out his hand towards people. A person who came and suffered for us, was rejected, was tortured, put his life on the line so that we can be reconciled to God, so that we can be healed. And all he asks is that we believe. And we believe by reading about him in the New Testament. We read about his self-giving love. We read about his teachings, his healing of people, his spiritual battles with demonic dark spiritual beings with the devil. We learn about his example. And so I want to read something from the Old Testament that actually points towards Jesus. And this is in the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is from about 700 years before Jesus. And a lot of his prophecies point towards the Messiah, And so even people had never even heard of Jesus. This is 700 years before his life. I'm going to read you one of his prophecies, and I'm sure you will recognise who he's talking about. This is Isaiah 53 from verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so Isaiah was talking about Jesus and what he would be doing in the future to reconcile us back to God. If you don't believe that we need to be reconciled to God, then you're not going to be able to believe in Christ's message. If you believe that all the evil and suffering is perpetrated by other people apart from yourself, you are not going to believe that you need healing and transformation to be changed, to be sanctified, so that you can be reconciled to God. If you believe that human beings are one day going to become amazing people and create a utopia on this planet you are also not going to believe the Christian message 
which says that, in fact, it isn't us that is going to do that. It is going to be God that does that at the end of time when he creates the new heavens and the new earth. If you don't believe that you need a saviour, you won't call out for Jesus. If you believe that you can do it alone, that you want to continue to do it alone, you won't call out to Jesus. And what you will do instead is put someone or something in his place. And surely by now, we know that all of those things are false idols. Where are you getting your stability and security from? Is it money? Is it power? Is it status? Is it your job? Is it your family? Is it your wife? Husband? Is it your own will, your own intelligence? Is it a a guru, a therapist, a spiritual leader? Is it other spiritual beings? Is it spirit guides? There'll be something that you'll be putting in the place of God. And over time, you will realise that thing is not going to save you. It is not going to provide you the stability, the anchor, the foundation that you need. And at that point... I hope and I pray that you do just pray a simple prayer and say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Show me what I need to do. Show me that you're real. Show me that you love me. Show me that you answer prayers. Because I've come to the end of myself and all of my false idols and all of my fake and unstable belief systems And I'm crying out to you. And so reading from Isaiah 55 from verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. From Isaiah 65, from verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labour in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. 
Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The prophets of old speak about future events. The prophets in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. They also pointed to the new heavens and the new earth. Now, the new earth is a very modern teaching. If you know anything about the new age, you will know that the creation of a new earth is part of their core teaching. But within the new age, the people who are creating the new earth are us, because the new age is essentially a humanistic tradition. And so in the new age, people are supposed to be, um, through meditation, vibrating their way into a higher dimension and in so doing, bringing the earth with it. And so a lot of these teachings that are in modern spirituality come from the Bible. But of course, what happens is God is removed and Of course, if you're removing God, you're removing all of the spiritual power. There is no way on this earth that people who are meditating are going to be changing anything about this reality. They are certainly not going to be creating a new earth. And this is what I'm talking about in terms of limited knowledge. Most people don't know that the culmination of the whole biblical story is God creating a new heavens and a new earth. Most people think it's us going to heaven when we die or hell. And so this idea of like, oh, I know what the Bible says. I know what the story is. You don't if you haven't read the Bible and you will be tricked by some of these modern spiritual teachers and teachings that have taken teachings directly from the Bible, twisted them and presented them as truth. And so I'm going to read you something from the very end of the biblical narrative. The very end of the New Testament is the book of Revelation. Many people know this as the prophecy about the end times. Lots of people have tried to decode it. Who is the Antichrist? What is going to happen? But I'm going to read you the very end, so chapter 21. And this is all about God creating things new. And so this is John, the Apostle John, writing and telling us what he's seeing in his vision. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He also said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have his heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters and all 
liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulphur, which is the second death. It's interesting, isn't it, that we can read the beginning of that passage and feel the love of God. He's going to make everything new. The old things, the former things have passed away. He's going to wipe away every tear. There's going to be no pain. And then we get to the end and suddenly we want to run away. Because so much of modern spirituality is just the good stuff. God is love. Everything's going to be fine. He's going to heal everyone in the end. And I think the reason why people actually turn away from Christianity and the Bible and Christ's teachings is that they don't want to be judged. They don't want to acknowledge that sometimes they are cowards, that they lie, that they are idolaters. They don't want to admit there's anything wrong with them. That is why people run away. They don't want to face the judgment of a true and just and fair God. But you can't have peace if you don't have justice. You can't say that God is loving if he is not fair and just, which means that there needs to be consequences for people's actions. Yes, there's evil in the world. Yes, there's suffering. And the people who cause that evil and suffering need to be brought to judgment and justice. That is logical. That is coherent. You might not like to believe it because you don't want it to apply to you. But I imagine that all people who look out in the world and see evil and suffering would like the people who are the perpetrators to be brought to justice. And so this is a very coherent worldview. And once we understand and trust Christ because of who he is and what he did, then we can believe what he says. We can believe what is laid out in the book of Revelation or the book of Isaiah or throughout the Old Testament and the writings of the apostles. We can believe it because it makes sense. And so rather than being scared of the judgment or put off by this sort of very sensible and logical side to Christ's teachings and the teachings in the Bible, in other words, justice. Embrace it. Because if we have a true judge, one who can't be corrupted, as many of the judges are in our world, if we have someone who has the power and the will to actually bring justice and recompense to the world, then isn't that something or someone worth believing in? I'm going to read you some more of Isaiah, this time chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts, will do this. Don't we all crave righteousness and justice? Isn't that what we want for our world? Wouldn't that stop the suffering and the evil if there was true recompense and justice? And so doesn't it make sense to trust in our Creator? Isaiah 26 Verse 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. 
That's what we want, an everlasting rock, a solid foundation for us to rest on and build on. The book of Psalms is somewhere for everyone to find comfort, especially when we are feeling afraid. Psalm 56, in God I trust. Perhaps you can relate to how King David is feeling in this psalm. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause, all their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings, Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. What do we need to do? Call out for God. Call out for help. Thank God for all of the things that we have, all that the things that allow us to live. Get into a state of gratitude shift our own perspective so we're not always focusing on the negative and the suffering and the evil but when we are struggling asking for help psalm 121 i lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come my help comes from the lord who made heaven and earth he will not let your foot be moved he who keeps you will not slumber Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. A couple of other psalms to read when you need comfort of course psalm 23 the lord is my shepherd which is a good one to memorize because it's quite short and also psalm 27 the lord is my light and my salvation the lord is the stronghold of my life of whom shall i be afraid but i want to finish with some of the apostle peter's words from the new testament from his first letter and these few short verses really sum up what is happening in the world right now, I think. And so from chapter 5, verse 6, he writes this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And that is such a great formula. Humble yourselves. 
step number one. Acknowledge God. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. But what is our job? To be watchful, to be sober-minded, to understand that a lot of this evil and suffering is not just from human hands. This is a spiritual warfare that is going on. And that we are to resist firm in our faith, knowing that other people are suffering too. Of course, we're all suffering. But after we've suffered a little while, the God of all grace will restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. When we go through suffering, we become stronger. When we rely on God's strength and power, which works through our human weakness, then we will be able to endure the suffering. The suffering isn't going away. The evil isn't going away. So we need to learn to endure, to become mature, to become steadfast, to have faith and to humble ourselves and ask. Seek his face, pray. And so let's finish with the Apostle Paul from his letter to the church in Ephesus. So Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up your shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And so Paul, at this time in prison, in prison for spreading the gospel, the good news, about Jesus and his defeat of death and that he is king of the universe. And so these are huge concepts, talking about spiritual forces of evil, talking about Jesus' resurrection and him being king of the universe. But these are the ideas that the apostles were imprisoned for, these are the ideas that they died for, that they were persecuted for. And when you look out in the world, doesn't it make sense? Aren't we fighting against the schemes of the devil? And so what is the solution, this armour of God that Paul is talking about? Standing firm, putting on the belt of truth. Truth. What is the truth? What is the foundation? That's up to us to look into. Not to just dismiss and say, oh, well, it's just my truth or your truth or there is no truth and it's all subjective. But not just finding the truth, but also standing in it calling out lies. This is what gives you strength, not going along with the crowd and believing what everyone else believes. Standing up for the truth is going to give you strength, is going to be part of that armour. The breastplate of righteousness, doing right to other people, having integrity, understanding the gospel of peace, standing firm in our faith in God, which he says, extinguishes the flaming darts of the evil one and then taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God so if we are reading the bible if we are reading the words of God 
and speaking them out loud, which is why I always recommend when you are praying the Psalms, you actually speak them out loud, that you are doing spiritual warfare. The helmet of salvation is to protect your mind. All of the doom and gloom, all of the negativity, all of the victimhood, all of the despair. Of course, we can see it with our eyes, but if we have a strong foundation in God, then we know that we can pray, we know that we can ask for strength to endure what is going on, for ideas about how we can actually help ourselves and our brothers and sisters and people all around the world. But if we don't ask, we don't get. And as it says in, in James's brilliant letter, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. That's what the New Age movement's all about. What do I want? What do I need? I want a soulmate. I want some money. I want to go on holiday five times a year. Me, 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 I, 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 to spend it on your passions but we are supposed to be petitioning God to help us navigate through this incredibly confusing, incredibly despairing, incredibly tumultuous time. A time that was actually predicted by the Apostle Paul. This is one of the first passages I read when I opened the Bible. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about the Apostle Paul. I didn't really know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I didn't know anything. And here's what I read in, in Paul's second letter to Timothy, who was setting up the church in Ephesus, um, talking about godlessness in the last days. So from chapter 3, he writes this to Timothy. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And moving down into chapter 4, for a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves, teachers, to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Isn't that true today? Wandering off into myths. Always learning, never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Why? Because people don't want the knowledge of the truth. They want their truth. Beliefs that make them feel better. But that's not what life is about. That's not what existence is about. We don't want to live in a fantasy land and a bunch of delusions that are going to make us feel okay for a time, but ultimately are going to make you unstable in your thoughts. You want to wander off into myths. Well, myths aren't going to help you, aren't going to save you, aren't going to transform you because essentially they are lies. Lies do not transform you for the better. They transform you for the worst. The fuel that we run off is the truth. When our mind is balanced, when we're seeing things clearly, when we are seeking the truth and resting on that, no matter what persecution comes, no matter if we're not following the crowd, then we are going to be stable. We are going to have that sense of peace and well-being that everyone is looking for. But if you ignore the truth, the opposite will happen. You will be unstable. You cannot distort the truth and stay sane. And that is what we're seeing at the moment. Lots of insanity, lots of unreasonableness, a total lack of coherence, people who are arrogant, swollen with conceit, willful ignorance, people being proud of their ignorance almost, 
and seeking peace and truth and justice and love in all the wrong places. And so I implore you and I encourage you to start to read through the Bible because all of the things that you might be scared of, all of the kind of judgment and the fire and brimstone or whatever it is, whatever caricature you have in your mind, is going to be far outweighed by these amazing promises of God that he loves us, that he wants us to be reconciled, that he wants to indeed live with us, to dwell with us, to create all things anew, that if we focus on him, we will have peace, that we can trust him to carry us through the storm, to give us that foundation to rest on and to help us to become mature, to help us to endure. And all we need to do is ask. And so I would encourage you to do that today if you are feeling unstable, that you learn through reading the Bible, through reading the words of Christ, the apostles, the prophets, that we have a God, we have a creator who loves us, that he is giving us the solution to our pain and suffering, but we must turn from going our own way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. It's not our way, it's his way. Turn back to him. Ask him for help. Ask him what he requires. One of the first things, of course, is to admit your wrongdoing, to ask him to cleanse you, to revive you, to restore you, to change you into the person that he made you to be, to give you guidance, to give you provision, to give you love, to give you forgiveness. And so hopefully those passages that I've read to you today, especially from the prophet Isaiah, will give you some comfort for whatever suffering you're going through at the moment. Pray for others as well as praying for yourself. And remember, we have a God who loves us. And so I want to finish with a couple of psalms that I think might help you if you're feeling a bit unsteady. And the first one is Psalm 46. It's called God is our fortress. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God is with us. He is in control. Be still and know that I am God. With the nations raging, with the earth feeling like it's giving way, this is a great psalm to help us remember that God is in charge. Ultimately, God is in control. And so Psalm 27, a slightly longer psalm, this one of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire 
in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And so even though some of the imagery in the Psalms might feel alien to us, it certainly is ancient. We can still relate to this idea of being afraid, of having that feeling of people encamping against us, of having enemies, and of crying out for help, wanting to be protected, wanting to be sheltered. And in all of his Psalms, David is very confident, this is something to take from King David in his prayers, that he is confident, even though he is facing suffering, war, destruction, enemies trying to kill him. The way that he prays to God is to have total confidence that God is in charge and that God can save him. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. We need to be strong, we need to have courage, we need to have endurance to face suffering, but we also need to recognise that God is sovereign and that we can have faith in him and we do need to wait for him to move and in the meantime to pray just like David, to have confidence. Teach me your way, O Lord, your way, and lead me on a level path. And so I hope all the Bible passages will bring you some comfort. I'll put all the references in the podcast notes. But this really is about us taking the time to read through the Bible, to find parts that we can relate to, that speak to us, that are going to bring us confidence, comfort, that are going to help us to understand the mind of God and what he expects from us. And so there really is no substitute for reading the Bible. But nevertheless, I hope that helps and I will speak to you again very soon. Bye for now.